ancient Egypt. Land of great pyramids. Stunning artwork. Commanding pharaohs. And powerful empires. Egypt, above all ancient civilizations, has captured our fancy with its spectacular iconography and cultural charisma. But even as the ancient Egyptians proclaimed their power to the world, they buried a shocking secret about their reign. They erased from history the story of a subordinate kingdom from the south that rose up, overthrew their masters, and ruled as pharaohs of Egypt themselves. These conquerors were the Kushites, a civilization of builders, gold workers, and warriors from what is now Sudan. The fact that Kush was able to conquer Egypt is really a David and Goliath story. Yet today, Kushites have been all but forgotten. Why? Because of the color of their skin. These were dark-skinned Africans, vilified by the ancient Egyptians and slandered as savages by colonial-era archaeologists. They show them as people tied and bound on the bottom of the king's shoes. So it really was a kind of a racial profiling. Now, after centuries of derision, the incredible story of the Kushai uprising is finally coming to light. More enlightened archaeologists are digging their history from the sand and the sky. How does it look? Still intact? It's actually a tiny bit scary. Don't drag that rope! Science is revealing the inside story of the black pharaohs who brought Egypt to its knees. This program was made possible in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is the Royal Kush Cemetery of El Kuru in northern Sudan. The Kush answer to Egypt's Valley of the Kings. Many rulers of Kush were buried here, making it one of the few places to learn about their lives and how they managed to conquer Egypt. That's what attracted archaeologist Jeff Emberlin. At a pyramid called Ku-1, Jeff's team is moving 50 tons of earth to expose a royal tomb beneath. Inside, they hope to discover the identity of the king who built the pyramid and his place in the Kushite world. We want, first of all, to find out the name of the king. And second of all, we would hope that there would be additional information in material left in the pyramid about where they fit in history over 2,000 years ago. The Kushites left few written records, and most of their tombs and temples have been destroyed. Ku-1 is no exception. Before harsh weather and stone thieves got to it, the pyramid stood nearly four times its current height. This worn down giant comes with a checkered past. About a hundred years ago, American archaeologist George Reisner excavated many Kush monuments and discovered the tombs of its most important kings. 
George Reiser was an amazing pioneer of archaeology in Kush. He started in 1908, he worked into the 1930s, uh, very difficult conditions, and yet he managed to establish a basic chronology, not only of the broad archaeological periods, but of the, all the kings of Kush. He put them all into order, and it's an order that we still basically use today. At El Kuru, Reisner got to the bottom of every pyramid, except Ku-1. There, fear got the better of him. The ceiling of the pyramid had collapsed, locking its secrets inside. Having just lost five men in a cave-in nearby, Reisner went home. Sometimes Jeff Emberling has thought of doing the same. When you read Reisner's notes from his excavations at El Kuru, at the end of the season, he took about two weeks off. And he has a little note that the doctor told him he had to stop worrying so much. And I can kind of appreciate this now, even just excavating one of the pyramids, because there's inherent risk. There's no such thing as no risk. Of course, without risk, there's no reward. And as Reisner discovered at other royal burial sites, the payoff can be staggering. Reisner recovered troves of gold jewelry and stunning artifacts. Intricate masterpieces buried with the Kushite kings to enrich them in the afterlife. As an archaeologist, you, your, your dreams are often quite vivid about what you can find in a place. And so obviously these king's burials were once extremely rich with gold and silver objects and um, finely crafted, uh, beautiful expressions of their religious sentiments as well as their, their status and prestige. So we could imagine finding all of those things. Jeff's first big revelation is not gold treasure, but a giant staircase, one fit for a king-size funeral procession. But it's a smaller feature that grabs his attention. You can see that this staircase is really monumental. They've dug down through the solid rock to a depth of over 25 feet. And you can see just at the bottom there, the original doorway and above it, an irregular hole that's almost the same height. That irregular hole was dug by looters. Jeff believes it was an inside job. Most people would not know that if you dug through the rock that there would be an open chamber that high up. It's over 15 feet off the original ground surface. But unusually in this pyramid, the inner chamber is huge and high. Uh, and so it was only the people who built that that would have known that digging over the doorway, they'd break into the open space of the chamber itself. The question is, how far in did the looters get? And what did they leave behind? Jeff will soon find out. Already, he's excavated to the site of the cave-in that had blocked Reisner's path. We're, we're in the second room of the, of the pyramid, but actually we're not in the room because its ceiling has entirely collapsed. And so we're standing in the hole covering whatever was below. I have a secret theory that really what happened is the looters burrowed in here, and as they were digging, the ceiling collapsed on them. Jeff's taking precautions to ensure he and his team don't become the tomb's next victims. At a makeshift workshop, his colleague, architect Ignacio Forcidel, builds life-saving iron supports. Inside, inside. In the second chamber, which is the deepest one, uh, there's uh, some problems in the ceiling. The rocks are falling down from there, and there have been several collapses during history. There was one small collapse like two weeks ago. Uh, 
Once installed, Ignacio's iron arches should prevent the roof from falling as Jeff and the team dig for the dead king. If it works, they just might succeed where Reisner did not and help right the great wrong perpetrated by the famous colonial archaeologist. Throughout his time in Sudan, George Reisner excavated amid the rich local culture of his African hosts. He was pulling African history from the ground, but he was doing it at a time when colonial delusions of racial superiority crippled his scientific judgment. Even as he was awed by the pyramids he excavated, he refused to believe they could have been built by the ancestors of the black Africans he saw all around him. His prejudices even seemed to have clouded his eyesight. In 1916, when he discovered beautiful black granite statues of the great Kushite kings, he argued they were not real likenesses. Instead, he proposed that the kings and the builders of all the Kushite monuments had actually been light-skinned foreigners. I think it just challenges so fundamentally some of his personal views about what people in the Sudan were capable of, um, that he finds it really difficult to suddenly read the evidence. It's such a huge challenge that he can't get over it. Reisner's writings about the Kushites are a window into his warped racial beliefs. Its very race appears to be a product of its poverty and its isolation. A Negroid Egyptian mixture fused together on a desert riverbank too far away and too poor to attract a stronger and better race. Reisner wasn't the last or the first to disparage the Kushites. Until recently, most archaeologists thought Kush, often called Nubia, was nothing more than a subject state within Egypt's empire, a source for gold in peacetime, and slaves during war. It was an image first cultivated by the Egyptians themselves who had an often volatile relationship with the Kushites, a relationship that dates back to the birth of both nations. Kerma, Sudan, lies about 170 miles down the Nile from El Kuru. At its heart is a defufa, which means brick monolith, A temple for sun worship, it has been dated to about 2500 BC, around the same time Egyptians were building their first pyramids and the Britons Stonehenge. According to archaeologist Salah ad Din Mohammed Ahmed, that makes it one of Africa's oldest surviving buildings. The Dafufa stands in the middle of the ancient town of Karma, which is one of the most ancient towns of the whole planet, certainly the oldest uh, in Africa. The Dafufa is also one of Africa's oldest examples of manufactured brick, indicating a sophistication in construction comparable to the Egyptians. Also around Kerma are some of the continent's most ancient burials.
Taken together, the archaeological evidence points to a civilization that was already well developed in 2000 BC, when its better known neighbor, Egypt, united into a pharaoh led empire. At first, the two up and coming nations were peers and forged a mutually beneficial relationship. It was often a relationship based on trade. Um, evidence from Egyptian tombs shows depictions of people from the Sudan bringing tribute, as it's always characterized, into Egypt. So items like uh, leopard skins, monkeys, uh, precious stones. Because of its location on the Nile, Kerma grew into a thriving trade hub between sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt funneling ebony, ivory, and exotic animals north. But it was gold that fueled the Kush's rise to power. They mined it from the Nile River Valley and sold it to Egypt. The Egyptians had an insatiable appetite for jewelry, not to mention the gold leaf coffins and funerary masks made famous by King Tut. Kush was traditionally known to the Egyptian as the land of gold. So most of the gold of the Egyptian state came from Nubia, and mostly came from this area and also from the eastern desert to the east of, of Karma. The Egyptians also documented the Kushite skill as archers, calling them the bow people and employing them as mercenaries. And Egyptian instructions on fighting record the Kushites' prowess as wrestlers. A tradition that still thrives in Sudan today. What the Egyptians didn't know was that the full force of the Kushite military would one day be turned on them. The Kushites started small, with incursions across the border to expand their territory. The Egyptians responded with anti-Kushite propaganda. And then, war. They would describe Kush as wretched Kush or vile Kush. The Egyptian images of, of Kushites from that period, they show them as people bound up, you know, tied and bound on the bottom of the king's shoes. Kushites are uh, depicted in Egyptian art, usually in very highly stereotypical ways. So we very frequently see uh, depictions of the pharaoh grasping prisoners by the hair and executing them by hitting them over the head with his mace. And this is a classic depiction as peoples that are uh, downtrodden and are worthy uh, only really to kill. The Egyptian representations of Kush, at least at an official level, tended to portray them as more tribal, more savage. So it really was a kind of a, almost a racial profiling. racial profiling that probably made it easier for the Egyptians to justify taking over the country. In about 1500 BC, Egyptian pharaoh Thutmose I invaded Kush to eliminate the growing threat and get direct access to the gold he coveted. His army plunged south until they reached a sacred butte called Jebel Barkal, or Pure Mountain. On its southwest face, a nearly 250-foot pinnacle pierces the sky. For Kushites, its unmistakably phallic shape made it a symbol of creation 
and fertility. But according to archaeologist Tim Kendall, the Egyptians saw a more important meaning in the mountain. What made this mountain so powerful and meaningful to the ancient Egyptians was the fact that it had this gigantic uh, spire-like pinnacle on its south face that reminded them of multiple things that, that had great religious meaning. On the one hand, it looked like a rearing cobra. On the other hand, it looked like a standing king, Osiris, the mythical first king of Egypt. The cobra is the key. In Egyptian mythology, cobras have a powerful connection to kingship. Goddesses take the shape of a cobra to protect the king. That's why they appear on the crowns of pharaohs, including King Tut's. Kendall believes it was probably a high priest accompanying the invasion who first saw the connection. Like a giant religious Rorschach test, the mountain revealed its importance before his very eyes. Jebel Barkal was deemed magnificent enough to be the birthplace of the god of gods, Amun. It confirmed the king's feeling that he was the rightful ruler of this place. Here was the center of the primeval god who had given, who had started kingship here, and he was the heir of this kingship, and he had an absolute right to rule Kush. Once anointed, Jebel Barkal quickly found its way into sacred Egyptian art. Here, Pharaoh Ramses II makes an offering to the god Amun. Amun sits on a throne inside a mountain that can only be Jebel Barkal. The pinnacle is represented by a giant cobra wearing the white crown of Egypt. This artwork was discovered inside Abu Simbel a temple Ramses II built near the Kushite border. Ramses had visited Jebel Barkal, and Tim Kendall thinks the mountain inspired the pharaoh to decorate Abu Simbel with four statues of himself. But Abu Simbel is famous because it's, it has four colossal statues in, in front of it. And I think that when Ramses was here, he saw four colossal statues on the front of the mountain. For a long time, people have assumed that there were four figures carved in the face of the mountain. But actually, these are just natural formations. Uh, they never were carved. Ramses and other pharaohs also honored Jebel Barkal by building temples in its shadow and the Egyptians sought to capture the mountain's divine magic by coming here to be crowned. We don't know exactly what happened in this temple, um, but we think that the king came in here during his coronation, came into this inner chamber with the god Amun, in an effigy, of course. Here, the two of them, father and son, united with the god Osiris, Osiris was the mythical first king of Egypt. And then he went forth from the temple, climbed up the steps, sat down on the throne, and became king and got up and stood on the porch and was greeted by the mob outside as the new living god. Over the generations, the legend of Jebel Barkal grew and the Egyptian influence on Kush did too. Kushites embraced Egypt's religion, worshipped Amun, 
and even began building pyramids like their imperial masters. I once wrote that the Kushites became the first Egyptophiles. But I think it's more complicated than that because they were adopting a worldview that had been long established, and they, they saw themselves fitting into it perfectly. Well, I think you have to look at this from the perspective of the imperial oppression. So at first, Kush was conquered by Egypt, but to survive, um, Kushites had to adapt themselves to Egyptian culture. So really to put this in the parlance of, of modern America, they had to pass as Egyptian. For 300 years, the Egyptians occupied Kush and imposed upon them the cult of Amun. At Jebel Barkal, a fundamentalist fervor took root. The mountain kindled the religious spark that in time would set Egypt ablaze and turn Kushites into pharaohs. At El Kuru's Ku-1 tomb, Jeff Emberling and his team have pushed beyond the rockfall that stopped George Reisner a hundred years ago. They're at the very end of their dig season, and Jeff's funds are running low. But suddenly, they're rewarded with an unexpected find. We've done a huge amount of work to remove the soil that Reisner had already found, and we were wondering all along whether there was going to be a two burial chambers or possibly a third, and we discovered a doorway to the inner third burial chamber. It's extremely exciting. You can just see the outline of this perfectly preserved doorway um, that goes into the what will have been the final burial chamber of this pyramid. A final chamber that could contain a treasure trove of burial objects, or the bones of a king. For Foreman Mansour Muhammad Ahmed, the nearness of their goal fuels one last push. والله أنا بحس بنفسي نحن دخلنا شديد في التدوير عنه يعني المفروض يكون من بدري نحن ندور عنه ونعرف عنه وكل شيء. Already, the team has learned one important clue about the king who built Ku-1. He chose its location carefully. He's tucked in next to another more humble one-chambered tomb that once contained perhaps the greatest of all Kushite kings. On this platform once lay the body of Pianki, the black African king who conquered Egypt. By 700 BC, some 800 years after their invasion, Egypt had withdrawn from Kush. The new kingdom empires of Tutankhamun and Ramses II have fallen into chaos. Warlords from Libya fought for control of the north, while priests of Amun tried to hold the south together. The priests feared the cult of Amun would be destroyed. They knew their survival depended on reuniting the torn nation. So they turned to the most unlikely rescuer imaginable, their assimilated but much derided former colony, Kush. There, the young King Pianki, a zealot for a moon, was more than ready to heed the call. He pledged to take on the Libyan kings, bolstered by the belief that a moon was on his side. Pianchi claimed, gods make kings, people make kings, but Amun made me king. 
his forces moved north on the Nile to Thebes. He told his army, string the bow and let loose the arrow. Let the people of the Northland taste my fingers. It wasn't long before Pianchi's enemies begged for peace. Be merciful, cried one Libyan king. I cannot see your face for shame. I cannot stand before your flame. I tremble at your strength. The fact that Cush was able to conquer Egypt is really a David and Goliath story. Egypt has these huge cities, huge temples, lots and lots of people, and Cush, the settlements are more dispersed. Um, so we're trying to figure out exactly how Cush was able to amass that military power. However unlikely his victory, Pianchi and his successors became Egypt's 25th dynasty. They controlled the wealth of an area stretching from modern-day Khartoum to the Mediterranean, becoming rivals of mighty Assyria and Greece. Pianchi credited Amun for his success. In an engraving of his coronation, Amun himself crowns the new pharaoh. The goddess Mut, called mother of all gods, looks on as Pianchi bows before a moon. He offers a simple gift to the god of gods. The ram-headed a moon tells him, I said while you were still in your mother's womb that you would be ruler of Egypt. Then Amun presents Pianchi with the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt uniting the shattered land. Pianchi's coronation stele sent a powerful message to a devout nation. Propaganda at its best. Political power has always been connected with uh, religious uh, beliefs to convince the people that you have the right to rule over them you have to be religious, and they're using this to control everything, the gold mines, the trade routes, and everything. I think we have the same phenomenon today. We will keep doing the same things forever, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Pianchi ruled from Kush for about a dozen years before handing the crown over to his younger brother, Shabaka. Shabaka moved north to take over the Egyptian capital Memphis and settle unrest in the Nile Delta. He launched a renaissance of building on a scale not seen since Egypt's new kingdom heyday. Shabaka and his brother before him earned reputations as strong, merciful leaders. They were famous for their, for their piety and their magnanimity. For example, they didn't slaughter their prisoners, they forgave them. They put them to work digging canals. These are completely uncharacteristic features of, 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 of ancient kings. Pianchi and Shabaka's triumphant reigns paved the way for Pharaoh Taharqa, who battled Egypt's foes far beyond the empire's borders. Around 700 BC, he even saved Jerusalem and King Solomon's temple from an assault by the Assyrians. For this act, recorded in the Old Testament, Hebrew historians hail Taharqa as a savior of the people. But the Assyrians would have their revenge. They dogged Taharqa's reign with invasions and ultimately 
rolled his borders all the way back to Thebes. When Pharaoh Taharqa died, he wasn't buried at Alkuru like his predecessors. Instead, he had his pyramid built in nearby Nuri. Tim Kendall thinks his reasons for doing so were supernatural. On the ancient Egyptian New Year, seen from Jebel Barkal, the sun rises behind the top of Taharqa's pyramid. It symbolizes new life and resurrection. Three and a half months later, if you're standing on the summit of Taharqa's pyramid looking to Jebel Barkal, the sun sets right over the pinnacle, and the, the pinnacle looks like the god Osiris. The setting sun symbolizes the god's death. It's exactly the time when the Nile falls, when fertility ends, and the god is thought to die. So he, he's born on New Year's Day, he dies three and a half months later when the Nile falls. He's resurrected every year and he's reborn millions of times, year by year. Taharqa, says Kendall, built his pyramid here to form a bond with Jebel Barkal that would last for all eternity. And even during life, Taharqa tied himself to the sacred mountain. He commissioned a monumental engraving on the pinnacle of the spire. In 1987, Tim Kendall was the first to see it up close. In the 1930s, some, some British officials studying the mountain face with binoculars had seen that there was some traces of ancient workmanship up at the top of this rock spire that was completely inaccessible. Well, I wasn't a climber, you know, I just uh, had this drive to find out what this thing was, you know, so I, I became a climber in order to solve this mystery. And um, I'm not sure I'd, I'd do it again. <laughs> Tim made repeated daring ascents, but climbing the crumbling 250-foot spire while photographing it was no easy feat. For his final report on the summit, he needs better photographs. When we did this exercise in 1987, our results from today's perspective are fairly primitive. Right along here. Fortunately, I connected with two professional climbers, and I asked them if they could climb up and finish the job. And that's the way we went up um, in 1987. Hazel Finley and Madeline Cope have bagged big walls on several continents, but this will be their first attempted summit in Sudan. Footing here is really unstable, so if you can hold on. Can we gear up? Cool. When we went up in, in 1987 and 89, we only had slides. Before the digital age, our capabilities are so much better nowadays. So it's, it's great to be able to do this again and have good, good photographs. Were there any sort of big, did you see quite a lot of big cracks when you were up there? I think there are enough. I think, I think you'll find enough to get, get along. But th there's a stretch up there where, where there's not much. Hazel picks the root, while Maddie belays from below. Hey, I'm just going slow because I don't have any pro. It's actually like a tiny bit scary. There's 200 feet of fragile rock between Hazel and their prize, an inscription left by one of Kush's most powerful kings. Watch out here, Mads. 
spring-loaded cams jammed into cracks keep her roped to the wall. But there aren't enough cracks. It looks okay. It just looks like there's no protection, you know? Already, Hazel sees signs of massive ancient construction. Huge holes bored into solid sandstone. Once, those holes held the wooden beams of a supersized scaffolding. Workers would have built the frame from the ground up, using a crane to hoist each beam into place. Like Hazel, their goal was the summit. Now they're on the tricky part. It's, it's straight up from there. There's not much to hold on to. I hope they know what they're doing. Hazel's reached the section the climbers fear most. 30 feet of smooth limestone with only holes left by Kushite builders to hang on to. Ooh. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Finally, Hazel reaches the summit. Okay, Maddie, I'm safe. Climb when you're ready. Congratulations, you made it. Now it's Maddie's turn to start up, while Hazel belays from above. Yeah, definitely carefully going to all of these holes. All right. On the summit. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. It's so like doing all the damn right Now it's time for the real work to begin. Repelling down the cliff face, Hazel looks for the engraving that few have seen up close since the Kushites created it more than 2,600 years ago. A bold declaration proclaiming the triumphs of Pharaoh Taharqa. From here to flick the rope. Be careful that you're going to be stepping onto the wall and that to your left. A little bit farther down. Great, now move around to the front. You see the inscription up there? Oh, yeah. How does it look? Crumbling. It looks like the left edge of the inscription has crumbled away. Can you see the little nail holes? Kendall believes that nailed on top of the engraving were thin sheets of gold. Making a bold, shining billboard to draw the eye of all who passed by. Ooh. Hey, bravo. <laughs> Can I give you a hug? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That was really good. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> wow, nice. Nice work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks Super a lot. Super triumphant. <laughs> yeah, it was cool to see the engravings. I felt really lucky to be able to see them and um, quite honoured, I suppose, to get a chance to like see a tiny part of uh, something that happened so long ago. Well, it'd be so <laughs> great to see your films and to see, see what, what we missed the first time. No, I don't, I don't even have a picture of that, so that's great. That's, oh, that's a wonderful shot. That's new. I've never seen that before. 
and then we, we weren't saw, sure, we weren't sure whether this was natural or not. It was really deep, long. So they were really hauling up stones and cement. Yeah. Well, this will be really great to add to the final report. Twenty-eight years later. I mean, yeah. Twenty-eight years later. Yeah. At last, it all comes together. What Tim can read in the damaged plaque is to Harka's declaration of his own divinity and a defiant jab at the Assyrians who drove him from Egypt. He calls them Bedouin. I, Taharka, the good god, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, who lives forever. I have destroyed the Bedouin of Asia, and I have cut down the desert dwellers of Libya. Though Taharka was an unrepentant warrior, by the time he died, he had very little of Egypt left under his control. His successors didn't seem to notice and persisted in declaring they were the pharaohs of both nations. In 593 BC, fed up with their bombastic proclamations, Egyptian pharaoh Samtik II led an army into Kush. Samtik also had an old score to settle Years before, a Kushite pharaoh had executed his great-grandfather. Samtik's goal? To erase the 25th dynasty from history by destroying every statue his army could find and chiseling Kush pharaonic names off every monument. In the ultimate insult to Kush, soldiers even chopped the sacred Egyptian cobra from Kushite crowns. The rewriting of history persists to this day. For example, just by looking at the facade of the Cairo Museum, where all the great dynasties of Egypt are, are inscribed on, the, on panels, marble panels, the only dynasty that's omitted is the 25th. Back at El Kuru, the discovery of the third room, the burial chamber, has gotten everyone excited. But Jeff's license to excavate has expired. In two days, he'll be heading home. The king's bones, jewels, and identity could be lying mere feet away. But the team will have to wait until next year to dig them up. So this is a very exciting moment, but it's also a disappointing moment. And unfortunately, with the time and the resources that we have available to us, we, we simply can't excavate this safely and responsibly this year. So it's very disappointing to get this far, to have moved 100 tons of sand and dirt, but we know that it will be here for us next year and we'll return and hope to find wonderful things. But Jeff's not going home entirely empty-handed. He's been invited to help out at a nearby dig site and to bring along some high-tech friends. This is Zuma Village, the site of a noble burial mound built around a thousand years after Taharka died. It was the twilight of the empire a rival African nation was about to wipe out the Kushites for good. And Christianity would soon transform the region. Hi, Jeff. Yeah, Mahmoud. Ah, Hello, Jeff. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Kullu tamam. Kullu tamam. Alhamdulillah. I have something here for you to see. Come along. At Zuma, 
Jeff's colleague Mahmoud Ed Tayeb has struck archaeology gold. Jeff, now we are approaching to the burial chamber. All right. I will show you. The layout of this white sandstone tomb is different from Ku-1. Here, a tunnel leads back to a shaft with burial chambers below. Jeff puts one of his robots to work. Broken burial objects indicate this tomb, like all Kushite tombs, has been hit by looters. But for the archaeologists, it's still a treasure trove of clues. Amazing. Isn't that incredible? OK, so there is a, a long-necked uh, jar in the back. Is that another variety of beer jar? Let's, uh, we'll pan over to the right. There's a pot stand with a cup. And what's that inside the cup there? It's a stone. Oh, just fallen perfectly into the, uh, yes. into the cup. Wow. Another oddity. A brick wall that looks like it could have been built yesterday. I'm going to just see if we can get a good view of the burial itself. At last, Jeff lays eyes on the bones of a king, or at least a nobleman, laid to rest in this tomb. This is just the beginning. It will take years of analysis to discover his place in Sudan's history. I really dreamed to find something extraordinary. And that was great, really, to have such a finds. A burials for kings. If I could talk to him, I would ask him, who are you? And what is the importance of this place in which you are buried now? Moreover, I would like to ask him, where are these red bricks came from? It, it's a find of a quality that we, we dream of. So, um, you know, I was really glad that Mahmoud was sharing it with us. And of course, I wanted it myself. <laughs> so it provided a great model for what we could hope to find here at Al-Kuru. By the time Zuma was created, the influence of Egypt had waned, and the kings of Kush no longer built grand pyramid tombs. Their zenith as pharaohs had lasted just a century. But in that short time, these African underdogs had toppled a giant and seized their place among the great empires of the ancient world. And now, thanks to the science underway in Sudan, the kingdom of the black pharaohs is stepping out of the shadows forever. To learn more about this program, visit pbs.org. Rise of the Black Pharaohs is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. This program was made possible in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.